Argyll, current deadlock in SAR, initiatives, hurdles, and possibilities. Dr. Chaudhary, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Sylvia. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if we'll be able to we energize SARC at the end of this conference, but I hope we'll be able to re-energize you uh, with, our, with our lunch and, uh, uh, and, uh, and dessert. Uh, I'm calling this meeting to order. Uh, I will uh, begin by giving the floor to the distinguished former Foreign Minister of Nepal, Mr. Uh, Ramesh Nath Pandey. Uh, uh, you have the floor for the next 18 minutes, sir. And uh, Mr. Pandey has been a very distinguished politician in Nepal, has been a cabinet minister in several cabinets, and is also uh, uh, biologically related to my co conspirator to my right, who is the founder of Mr. Pandey. This way you have the floor. Mr. I would like to first be thank the Kusat and the IS yes, for cooperating with one another and I mean I this time you also and it's something that is close to our hearts. All of us are aware that this was a taking place of the time of big entity in South East. He's the guy of the the Trump administration is still credible in its conduct of international affairs. I have only seen our apprehensions. The question arises, as the U.S. receives from the international both political and economic, will China, India, the EU, and the Western Federation tried and filled some of the space that it has vacated. What is the nature of the relationship between these actual powers? Will it be mutually collaborative or more and more hostile? This has died bearing on the security and well being of small countries here in Southeast Asia and back home in Southeast Asia. Let me briefly offer you a few bullet points in my assessments on these dramatic developments and also on the ways and means to re-energize the SART process which is the theme of this workshop. It is no secret that economic power is shifting dramatically Asia as a region. Asia already is the central of global marketplace. In this context, among the two largest markets, India and China, South Asia has not been able to chart out a role for itself to be able to collectively benefit from their rights. We are struggling to justify the role and function of South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SAR. In some its summit is indefinitely postponed since the 18th Kathmandu summit held in November 2014. Skeptics have begun to question the future of SAR and whether it has a relevance at all. We have not been able to restart the process of holding an early 19th summit with a crucial time such as this. But let me remind you that South Asia has a late start in the field of regional cooperation. It has already been three decades of the European Union's evolutionary process. 
going to an ASEAN tour. All the meeting tickets were in South Asian country, but still stand neighbors. We are living in past hangovers of complaints, revances, and mistrust. Only after a long quiet diplomacy and consultations, SAT was established in 1985. I would like to recall the initiatives of great King Virendra Bhikar and late President Akhamadesh Gyaur Rahman in this regard. As relations between New Delhi and smaller neighbors was not cordial at that time, these two leaders created such a goal to bring all the seven member states into the same boat and the idea of was here. Let me also reiterate that India's support was the main force of realizing the dream to establish this administration. Otherwise, we knew that this would be a platform of all others to carry up against it, but very strong in New Delhi. It was here that an understanding of bilateral continuous issues, not including sharp deliberations, was noted. Three decades later, now the Delhi has been successful in managing relations with its smaller neighbors. Not have the smaller neighbors been able to address New Delhi's genuine concerns and apprehensions. In 1989, the summit that we held, the 10th summit was held after a gap of gap of four years. Finally, the 18th summit decided to hold the summit only once in two years, and even that has not been accomplished in the last three years. Therefore, the last three years, three years displayed very many painful stories of lost opportunities and opening of South Asia. As other nations, as other regions marched ahead on a path of better connectivity and depending trade, finance, energy, and security cooperation we will have behind. <coughs> we are still far away from what the 1985 declaration had envisioned to cooperate regionally, work towards finding solutions towards common problems in a spirit of friendship, trust, and mutual understanding, and to the creation of an order based on mutual respect, equity, and shared benefit. We also tried alternative approaches to regional cooperation and began exploring sub-regional efforts between some of us rather than all of us, such as the South Asian Growth Fundring, the BBIM, and also the BIM State EC. It remains to be seen, however, if this new initiative actually had the ability to achieve some concrete or only repeat the same lofty goals and objectives and periodically renew the commitment of the member states towards regional cooperation in our region. For now, it is our duty to re energize such process with the is in our collective interest to see that it is starts delivered. We have invested a lot in this project we must not follow it to fail. I think that the first challenge is a weak secretariat, originally designed as an extension of the foreign ministries of the member states, our forefathers envision to try an evolutionary process and then gradually make it effective. But new initiative has not been taken. It is powerless and regards to bridging communication gap and print understanding between member states, especially India and Pakistan. This direct contact is only with joint secretaries of individual foreign ministries, which is really adequate in a complex region such as ours. Secondly, all South members are occupied with fanfare and ceremonial part rather than research camps. At the Council of Ministers meeting, in March 1999, in Guerilla, in Sri Lanka, I proposed 
that we need to reduce the time here and set aside more time for the trick part of the summit, which has proven to be a useful platform. Leaders have in the subsequent years directed us to develop outcome oriented policies, programs, projects, and activities. But a lot more needs to be done. South Asia is at the center of international politics. As new adjustments are taking place in the domain of international relations, we have very little of investment in SARC already. Now it is the time not only to revitalize and re energizing these administrations, but also to make sure that it emerges as a regional force for the collective benefit of our soil. I think initiatives such as this being held today is very important to keep the candle of our body. I would once again like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity here today. Uh, wise words from a, from a wise man, of course. Uh, he pointed out some very practical difficulties uh, with regard to the functioning of SARC, for instance, the contact level of the secretariat, like as you say, with the directors general or joint secretary, is not sufficiently high enough in the governments to do action. And the, and the idea, which was almost cultural in our part of the world, that protocol uh, supersedes uh, uh, substance. And, uh, in uh, SARC, it's more often the case also because uh, sometimes substance is lacking. And uh, as we said earlier, that uh, nature is factory. So, protocol fills up the factory which substance lacks. So, I will now recognize uh, Major General Retired Dipankar Banerjee, uh, who has been a very active member of COSAT uh, almost from its inception, I, I gather. He is a member of the Forum for Strategic Initiatives. Delhi, India. General Banerjee, yours. Next Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and my very warm greetings and respects to all the senior personnel present here, in particular, of course, to Minister Vikram Pandey, who has been an inspiration and an active participant at this level for so many years. You know, the COSAT began in 2008 after a very successful conference in Delhi, uh, in India. Uh, on connectivity as a principal theme of the conference, we decided to have a follow-up conference in Delhi to see as to how those measures could be implemented. And with the result of the Conrad Retina Foundation, we held a regional seminar in 2008. It was a very successful seminar. The presentations were from all the think tanks, major think tanks in South Asia, former foreign secretaries and other leading uh, intellectuals and participants and we came to some very positive developments. So at the end of the conference, in consultation with uh, John Wolf, the representative of the Conrad and the Foundation in Delhi at that time, and of course, the active participation and support from people like General Muni, we held a conference the very next day, a half hour conference, among all the leading think tank participants, and decided to form the COSAT. Consortium of South Asian, Think tanks. Deliberately kept the name consortium because unfortunately one of the real tragedies in South Asia also is that our think tanks do not always last. They come and go, thrive and fade away. And that is actually what ought to happen. The founder organization, the IPCS, which I was heading then, uh, was of course the initial this thing. But IPCS is no more, vanished, gone. Very glad that they still has taken up this challenge and now taken this process forward. And we continue to receive support from the Conrad Abner Foundation, which I think is the principal reason why we continue to be able to carry on this particular activity. Uh, well, this should ask me to speak on this subject. Uh, I may have referred some other topic of regional cooperation, but the current strategic environment in South Asia and the possible role of South. Now, unfortunately, it is true that uh, it is necessary to address this question of uh, security cooperation because this is perhaps one of those uh, fundamental issues 
that is holding back the possibility of the development and satisfactory progress of the soft process. Now, I think in some respects we may have been somewhat ambitious in when this process was set up. Uh, because, you know, uh, in history, uh, there are not, yeah, uh, in history, there are not very many examples where countries with existing conflict situations between them can come together and form a regional cooperative partnership. If you look at Europe, the formation of the European Union was preceded, preceded by major and significant efforts at bringing the people and the intellectuals of France and Germany together, developing institutional mechanisms around Europe before a proper European Union movement started. Actually, at the RCSS, we tried to learn from that process as well as to how that had developed. Now, uh, you know, even within ASEAN, when it was formed, it was the threat of communism generally over the whole region that brought these five states together. In a conference that South Asia, RCSS, then, and ASEAN members held in Colombo in 2001, we tried to understand how ASEAN succeeded and why uh, uh, the uh, SARC process was not going anywhere. Uh, it was that threat of a common threat to the whole region of ASEAN that brought those five nations together and then helped to build on it, but much later. So I think it is neither fair nor realistic to that expect that South Asia will necessarily be different. So we have to address first the question of our strategic concerns between ourselves and each other, and then only can we realistically expect that uh, cooperation will fructify and materialize in a substantial manner. But let me also remind you at this stage, we all talk about the state of SARC nations today in terms of development, welfare, cross, development, cross uh, uh, domestic product, etc. But what was SARC or the SARC nations before this? It's important, and important for us to understand the potential of SARC and SARC regional cooperation. South Asia as a united subcontinent was the richest in the world till 1700. Uh, it was made penurious in 1947 with the partition of South Asia by the British. According to the balance of economic power, the Indian subcontinent, Indian subcontinent, uh, and in this I include all the economies of the South nations as they are today, at the largest and most advanced economy in the world for most of the period between the 1st century and the 18th century. During the Mughal Empire, it was the world leader in manufacturing, producing 25% of the world's industrial output in the mid-18th century prior to the British rule. Uh, South Asia experienced de-industrialization and impoverishment under British rule. Its share of the world economy declined from 24.4% in 1700 to 4.2% in 1950. And its global share of industrial output declined from 25% in 1750 to 2% in 1950. At independence, South Asia's life expectancy was around 27 years. And literacy was in the single digits and even less for the third child. So the myth of British benevolence and, I quote, unifying a fractured and backward subcontinent course, has finally been shattered by Shashi Tharoor in his very brilliant book, The Last Later Book, An Era of Darkness, brought out only last year. And this should be a recommended reading in most South states today. Uh, with impeccable logic and detailed statistics, there is proof that uh, how the South Asian economies 
were destroyed and devastated under the British rule. The British desire to rule this land in perpetuity made it adopt uh, its divide and rule strategy. Now, this was the fundamental cause of many of the ethno religious conflict, conflicts that continue in South Asia today. The process of partition itself was utterly flawed and unduly hurried, creating further division amongst the peoples. But the tragedy of South Asia has been its inability to rise above its many divisions and resultant military conflicts and forward a sense of meaningful cooperation. Seventy years should be enough for us to overcome these past hurdles and the legacy of the past. Therefore, the fault for this in large measure subsequently lies with us. You know, uh, so it was in the 1980s that the SARC process began and as uh, Minister Pandey has referred, we came together for the first summit on 7th, 8th December of 1985. Uh, the situation was still not conducive in terms of the strategic scenario or the security situation within South Asia, but it was a step in the right direction taken by leaders who had the vision and the ability to look forward and look ahead and hopefully try and formulate a joint consensus through which progress would be possible for future cooperation. Uh, but even then at that time, terrorism within South Asia, 1985, uh, was still such that uh, terrorism and counter-terrorism has featured in all SARS declarations as an important issue uh, for discussion. And uh, these issues continue to remain with us and we have not been able to fully resolve this. But however, why is this not moving? Sorry, 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 sorry. Yes. Uh, uh, my brief presentation related to examine the current strategic environment in South Asia and identify possible role, if any, for the South in this. You know, uh, it's a formidable task, but this is a challenge with think tanks in the region and particularly for COSAC, which must take up this challenge to much greater research and discussion to formulate alternative policy options. This is a large challenge that confronts Gossett today. I will briefly present in two parts. One is the current strategic environment, just highlight the issues that remain currently confronting us globally and in the region, and then the possible roles for South in, in, to enhance uh, cooperation uh, through the process of addressing some of the security concerns. concerns. Well, the current strategic environment now, in the second decade, near the end of the second decade of this century, is not very favorable. The International Monetary Fund's prediction for economic growth around the world is somewhat negative. Uh, challenge of global political uncertainty is extremely high with President Donald Trump's uh, regime in the US. Nobody seems to know from day to day as to what the next tweet will signify for the global situation. Uh, Ethno-religious conflicts continue in Eurasia and North Africa with a, a virulence and a regularity that are causing enormous concerns. Large-scale population movements, once again from Africa and uh, uh, West Asia to Europe, and in other areas are changing the political scenario and posing new challenges to these regions. Regular terrorist attacks are taking place today in Europe by giving rise to new concerns and new challenges. And today is the real possibility of uh, nuclear engagement in Northeast Asia. Uh, 
there remains tensions across the East China Sea and South China Sea, immediately to our uh, east within Asia. And therefore, much as we may feel that uh, we are far away from these developments, uh, but in an interconnected world that we are today, each of us will be affected in some measure or the other. And therefore, our collective resilience will be challenged how we deal with these problems. Within South Asia, the war in Afghanistan continues. We are still awaiting uh, Donald Trump's uh, strategy on, in Afghanistan. But this a member of SARC is going to be under enormous pressure for quite some years into the future. And the possibility of cooperation of Afghanistan being cut off from the rest of South Asia through physical connectivity over the major challenge. The India-Pakistan line of control in Kashmir has recently, in the last couple of years in particular, witnessed fairly intense exchange of fire and terrorist attacks. It was only <coughs> in 2002 <coughs> that from a statement uh, there were intense firing across the LOC in 2002-2003. But a mature leadership in India and Pakistan ended that exchange of fire and that brought about almost a decade of comparative peace in along the line of control. We have reverted back to a situation which once again poses considerable challenges to both countries today. Uh, both Pakistan and perhaps to a lesser extent Bangladesh, uh, but to a significant extent, is continuing to witness the possibility of terror strikes within their respective countries. And finally, I think uh, China's larger military presence uh, particularly in the uh, East Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean regions are to pose challenges <coughs> to the region and perhaps to maritime commerce for all of South Asia. And that will then be a serious challenge. Yet, there are favorable trends as well. Let me just identify a few of them. <coughs> uh, except for some uh, aggressive posturing, especially we have seen in the India-China border and we have seen an escalation of that in recent couple of months as well as a little earlier. But the reality is that Donald Trump has been fired in anger and then perhaps been pushing and jostling and there are effective confidence building measures which can ad actually address the problems that arise in this region. Both India and Pakistan are now uh, members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and uh, this may well prove to be uh, a forum where some dialogue and discussion could be possible between India and Pakistan on security issues. And finally, of course, China's one belt, one road initiative has taken uh, and has been accepted and is going forward. Though India did not take part the summit meeting of the forum <coughs> and expressed its genuine concerns regarding the implementation of the OBOR initiative. But if those questions and issues are addressed, uh, I see the possibility that India and China can get together and cooperate in these linkages. <coughs> Especially the BCIM linkage, which have been discussed in the past and uh, which though now a part of the OBOR initiative can always be linked and, uh, and uh, arrangements and go forward from there. We also have this pin stick arrangement and this finally moving forward. It is uh, uh, at the headquarters in Dhaka, uh, the first second general from Sri Lanka and the last summit held in Goa in last year, there were some positive developments that took place. Ministerial meetings continue. And there's, in fact, there's a real possibility that among these four countries in South Asia, with Thailand and Myanmar in Southeast Asia, larger economic cooperation will finally be possible. And finally, uh, 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 quite surprisingly, to an extent, I think, the South economies continue to do well compared to the rest of the world. There are major problems in major economies around the world, but the South economies are still 
fairly, doing fairly well. Now it isn't that uh, illegal that we need to look at the possibilities of SARC and security cooperation. Now, just like Ambassador Jolly, Ritika Jolly mentioned, uh, the SARC Charter has certain uh, restrictions in the process of issues that can be discussed and how they will be discussed. And uh, therefore, sovereign nations discussing collectively in a body such as this uh, bilateral security issues are not likely to be either feasible or lead to any positive results. And uh, SARC, of course, is not a supranational institution like the European Union has attempted to become. And uh, so there are inherent limitations in SARC as a medium for discussing security issues. But the potential of SARC to develop and build conditions in which security issues can be addressed will remain, and this is the issue that needs to be pursued with some vigor, and I would must say... Sorry, can you explain that again, sorry, the last point? Yeah, the last two points is, so in spite of all this, SARC as a forum to facilitate discussion and deliberations, to bring out new thinking and innovation, and ingenuity will be required in that, to find new ways of addressing this. But substantive discussions are not likely within the ambit of the SARC. Now, <coughs> of course, there are enormous examples regarding as to how this could be done, done. And I have, in my attempts over the last two decades, looked at many of these possibilities. You know, uh, there are good CBMs existing across the region. Further CBMs could be developed. Uh, Donald Xiaoping had advised uh, during the Rajiv Gandhi's visit in 1989 December, and I quote, that if the India China border proves difficult to resolve by this generation, the problem will be left for the next generation to resolve. Meanwhile, we should move forward to normalize and improve cooperation in all other dimensions. Now, that was the basis for India China relations to develop and India China bilateral trade to multiply by several times. Of course, trade was overall unfavorable to India, but nevertheless, what is unfavorable in a particular bilateral situation can be made up in other bilateral trade arrangements and would benefit both countries as it, as it did. Now, the same principle could be extended to the India-Pakistan situation. Notwithstanding all the difficulties in existing border alignments, and it will remain, as you know, part of our dialogue process, which itself is halted for several years now, uh, we could begin to cooperate and constructively engage each other in areas that are mutually beneficial to both countries. And that would, in a sense, bring about the possibilities of developing cooperative, cooperative relationships. Uh, uh, India Bangladesh uh, relations, I think, has shown a remarkable improvement in recent years. And one of the principal reasons was that both sides accepted that the terrorists of one country must be considered as terrorists by the other countries. And the extent of cooperation that came from Bangladesh towards India in dealing with the activities created that sense of goodwill between India and Bangladesh that allowed further cooperative arrangements to develop. You know, remarkably the maritime uh, agreement between India and Bangladesh. Excellent article by Tommy Ko comparing the resolution of this to the United Nations arbitration process and comparing it to South China Sea highlights the difficulties and the possibilities of this cooperation. And so this actually opens up an enormous economic cooperation possibilities in the entire Bay of Bengal region. And tomorrow's economy is equally a blue economy. And if this blue economy in this part of the region is developed, that has potential benefits for both countries. Uh, then India and uh, some regional arrangements through the Bangladesh, Bhutan, India and Nepal for bilateral cooperation arrangements have evolved. If you cannot cooperate within the larger framework of SARC, there is nothing prevents 
the, those countries that can to come together and then cooperate with each other. And so therefore, even though the BBI and has some difficulties, there are possibilities that this could have. Uh, and once the BBI takes off, then, uh, uh, then there will be uh, an incentive and uh, a result of that cooperation to be felt by others as well. Uh, finally, I think uh, in the new approaches, I must say that uh, 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 with greater goodwill, security issues between the re among the region, within the region, can also be addressed. We have a remarkable experience in the Helsinki process, again from 1935 and, fact, uh, and finalized in 1990 with the conventional forces in the Europe Treaty of 1990. In this situation, of course, China will have to be brought in. But the possibilities of an agreement of this nature within the ambit of South, I think should not be ruled out. Of course, this is not an agenda of the South today, and there will be serious objections from many countries to discuss this. But this is one possibility that we need. But this will require enormous amount of effort to find out and work as to what the solutions are likely to be. Other than that, there are many other possibilities. In Europe itself, I've just highlighted the you know issues of I think not here. Yes, defensive defense. Doctrines of defensive defense, 35 years ago, was a very live issue for discussion among the global Stanley community. You can ensure the defense and security of nations by bringing the forces of contending parties to very much lower levels, and yet provide an equal level of security. And so there are different concepts, different ideas, and within the genius of South Asian leadership and South Asian strategic thinkers, we should be able to find out options and uh, uh, abilities of uh, developing these. Uh, it will take a leap of imagination, that's what I've quoted, and of course, uh, uh, Dr. Mitra's advice that think tanks and sponsored results which want to take leaps of imagination. Let's see. We should consider this as a challenge that we need to uh, confront. Yes, finally, I think, notwithstanding all the developments that are there, and that we have done with Master Pandey's uh, question, uh, SARC process is stalled. We don't know for the next summit will take place, how this process will be taken forward. But we require new determination, and finally, I think, it must be converted into a people's movement. Now, there have been attempts in the past, all of you have participated in that. Also, I have done the same as well. Uh, there has to be a genuine people's movement that was developed all across South Asia to give that momentum to the political, political process and to give the legitimacy to our political leadership to undertake bold measures that can address these concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, okay, by, by the way, uh, the time taken by the chair's remarks must be left out of the speaker's uh, time frame. Uh, I'm glad that Professor Mitra is taking copious notes because we'll be inviting uh, to extrapolate some takeaways from the discussions today at dinner uh, this evening. Oh, uh, on security, of course, there is one point we will need to uh, remember that unlike uh, other, other regions like uh, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia and certainly Europe, uh, in, in, in South Asia we live with an, one intellectual confusion. Our borders are not sharply defined emotionally and intellectually. In other words, we don't know where Bengal, Bangladesh ends and what the West Bengal begins. We don't know where Punjab ends and, and the other Punjab begins. Uh, we are stressing both commonalities and distinctiveness at the same time. On the one hand, our peoples are being told that we have many commonalities that unite us. On the other hand, they are told that your sovereignties are linked to your distinctiveness from your neighbor. So this tension, this idea of reconciling commonalities and, uh, and distinctiveness is also a very major challenge particularly in the security sector. Uh, we are still with the Army uh, uh, top brass uh, in our discussions, and the narrative 
continues with another general now, whom I recognize, Major General A.N.M. Niruzaman, uh, old, uh, of course, I hand, of course, of your birth, and President and Chief Executive Officer of the Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies, General Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To start with, let me pay my compliments and regards to KS, the Chair as host of ISAS, Dr. Mitra, and Dr. Nishan Pandey for organizing this event and giving me this opportunity this afternoon to speak to you. As an old soldier, I go back to my old trade and briefly survey and scan the security landscape of South Asia for the reason that no organization, let, let it be SAR or any other organization, can devolve itself from a security environment of a region. <laughs> Particularly so, the growth of South Asian regionalism is completely intertwined and linked with the security environment of South Asia. South Asia, as we know today, is a security-centered region of the world. And to think of South Asia and regional cooperation and not talk about security is absolutely delving into fallacy. Therefore, my brief presentation today in the intervention will be entirely devoted to the strategic and security landscape of South Asia. The security landscape of South Asia is extremely Indocentric. Therefore, issues that deal with security in the region, the key player, the key player to intervene has always been India. It is therefore my contention and my belief that it is essential for SAR to work and succeed, we have to have an India that is comfortable with the SAR process. Unless we have a total comfort zone with Indian leaders in working with the SAR process, it is never going to succeed. And as we heard from the chair in the beginning, SAR took birth with suspicion from India. And I don't think it has ever overcome that feeling and suspicion. It is essential for the major country in the region to take note that it is not the smaller states ganging up against the larger state, but it is all states of the region trying to find ways and pathways for cooperation. If that is the feeling that we get from India, then we will have a total commitment coming from that country. The second security issue that I see problematic is that the SAR process has been hyphenated between the hyphenated relationship between India and Pakistan, where the other states and the members of SAR have not only become junior partners, but in some process, they become irrelevant. And that irrelevance has to go. It is an organization of regional cooperation. It is not an organization where the two major players in the organization settle their problems and disputes or find ways of cooperating with them at times. So we need a much better level playing field to see the aims and aspirations that were articulated by the founding fathers of SARC, especially President Zia Raman of Bangladesh, who mooted the idea to prosper and succeed. In that scale, I also see a problematic area which cannot be resolved geographically is the nature of asymmetric positions within South Asia. Here you have a geographic giant which is bordered by small and very small states. So therefore, this geographic asymmetry has to be accommodated 
in a practical manner. And we have examples of asymmetric relationship building with smaller countries in other regions that can be seen, studied, and perhaps best lessons taken. I see very good examples coming out of ASEAN where a fast child like Indonesia can manage its asymmetric relationship with very small, tiny city states like Singapore or small states like Brunei and many others. Therefore, managing the asymmetric position within South Asia is also a critical issue and an issue of security management. South Asia has also been a region where the neighborhood has been problematic. We saw a brief flicker of hope with Prime Minister Modi coming to power in India, articulating that the neighborhood is important, the neighborhood must be engaged, and the neighborhood must prosper together. But that brief flicker of hope died with India putting a blockade on Nepal, or India getting involved politically in Sri Lanka, or in Bangladesh. So we need an engaged neighborhood where such interference, such sort of relationship of detriments must stop. For other smaller countries to feel comfortable as members of a region that can have a working relationship of working together. We have had a bad history of such relationship of working but we thought for a brief while that that coercive nature of relationship might come to an end, but it ended very after a very brief period of hope. And we again hope that this nature of the coercive relationship that we had in the region in the past and continue to have should come to an end for better stability and better security management. SAR should also not be used as a platform for narrow fulfillment of national interest. It's a regional body where every single country will have an equal voice. And no single country must ever use this platform to pursue its narrow political, diplomatic, and security agenda. We saw that most of the SARC summits, or all of the SARC summits, were called off for the interest of one member country. Therefore, many other members in the regional body lose hopes when such platforms are used for narrow interest. Sometimes, other smaller members have been used as proxies to kill the process. Such utilization of proxy powers within the organization must stop if we ever want to see a functional relationship amongst all members of the SARC community. It is also ironic for me to say that the last summit was stopped and scrapped by the country that put in the concept of SARC. So Bangladesh was used or was encouraged to call the summit in Islamabad and such practices must stop. If we do a strategic scan of the security relationship in the region, then at the very least we can say that the relationship is extremely complex. We not only have complex security relationship between India and Pakistan, we have equally complex security relationship between Pakistan and Afghanistan, between India and the Maldives, between India and Sri Lanka, increasingly with India and Nepal. So therefore, the complex relationship on the security field between countries and amongst countries in the region is extremely problematic. And that is a relationship we have got to get away with and nurture 
the relationship of cooperation, of amity, and of friendship. A major area of contention in the region on the security arena has been the rise of militancy and terrorism, especially the acquisition and the counter-acquisition of harboring militants and terrorists in other countries. It is heartening for me to say that my own country, Bangladesh, has shown the way how such problem can be resolved in a cooperative manner and with mutual benefit of all countries. But there are existing problems of harboring and nurturing militants and terrorists in other countries in South Asia for which the relationship cannot be built amongst the countries of the region and that needs to be resolved. South Asia is also a region which is largely post-conflict, post-internal war, and post-nature of tension. We have countries in the region from Afghanistan to Sri Lanka to Nepal, which are all post-conflict countries and post-conflict societies. And that is a fact of life that we have to reckon with. And when we deal with such countries, the conditions of post-conflict societies have to be taken into account. South Asia is also home to a number of internal insurgencies and internal armed struggles and movements, and they also impede the process of regional cooperation on a regional scale. We have to take note of the armed struggles in the Fata area. We have to take note of the insurgencies of the arms movement like the Maoist movement in India and many other such movements within the region and then deal with them accordingly. South Asia has been a region of protected conflict and conflict that has not yet gone away or resolved. Dealing with protected conflict needs a different kind of complex approaches to conflict resolution. We have not yet been able to address those conflict resolution strategies in South Asia and it is time for us to take note of that. The region has also not been able to evolve any comprehensive CBM or more importantly CSBM regime within South Asia. Therefore it is time for us to work out comprehensive mechanisms of CBM and CSBM within the context of South Asia. South Asia has also seen a number of undisputed conflicts, potential areas and disputes that result needs to be addressed, if not resolved, instantly. Issues like the Kashmir issue between India and Pakistan, issues of contention in the maritime space between and amongst the countries of the region need to be addressed to bring harmony to relationship that can build a proper and a lasting security stability situation in the region. South Asia is also home to some of the fastest growing militaries, both in the conventional scale and also in the nuclear scale. Therefore, a region that has grown so rapidly in terms of expansion of its military capacity has to take a stock of how it is being conducive to the growth of regional cooperation or it is not being conducive to regional cooperation. It is of my opinion that the rapid expansion of the military capacity, the rapid expansion of the military expenditure in South Asia is also a hindrance to regional cooperation. And it is time for us to build those kind of understanding among states so that such kind of rapid expansion stops. And when we continue to spend such large amount of money for our military expansion, we naturally overlook some of the human security needs in the region. Therefore, South Asia is also home to the largest number of issues related to human security needs of its people. We have not been able to address 
many of the basic needs of South Asians in South Asian countries, whereas we have very happily expanded and overexpanded our capacity in building large arsenal of weapons and equipment and also involved in large expansion of the nuclear capacity. It is time for us to look into these issues and devote more of our resources and time in building the human security situation in the region because we have always mentioned that SARC is a people-centric organization and to make it a people-centric organization we need people who are secure from their human needs and it is time for us to devote our time to those needs. South Asia also unfortunately is one of the most nuclearized regions of the world. The countries that formed the organization, out of the eight member countries, two are nuclear armed countries with a history of protected conflict and undisputed and disputes which have not been resolved. Therefore, South Asia today lives under a nuclear shadow. And living under a nuclear shadow is not a comfortable situation for growth of regional cooperation. We have to have some kind of a regime in South Asia where our nuclear stability situation, our nuclear expansion capacities must be taken into our stock so that South Asia today should not live in fear of a nuclear shadow or a potential nuclear conflict. I also take note of the rapid growth of technical nuclear weapons in South Asia, the TMWs, are a real threat and a menace to a situation of stable security in case of any potential conflict. South Asia has also got a number of non-traditional security challenges which are extremely serious and problematic. South Asia is extremely food insecure, South Asia is extremely energy insecure and perhaps one of the most insecure regions of the world in terms of water security. Large number of South Asians today live in water insecure environment and they will continue to move to more insecurity as we continue to mismanage water and don't build up a basic management for our water management system in South Asia. It is home to some of the largest rivers in the Himalayan Basin area. Yet today, we don't yet have a water basin management system in South Asia. Therefore, the prospect of not only water insecurity, but the prospect of a hydro conflict in South Asia becomes a real possibility. I see grave dangers in South Asia of a potential hydro conflict if the Indus Treaty breaks down between Pakistan and India and in the recent past we saw some very active symptoms of the treaty which had survived some major wars between the two countries faltering with the possibility of a breakdown and if that happens then we could see the prospect of a major hydro conflict developing in the area and also the potential of a the hydro tension that exists between India and China that also could touch South Asian region between China and India about the water sharing of the Bhamaputra rivers. These are issues that also impede the process of regional cooperation. South Asia has also not addressed the issues of transnational security well. We have serious issues of human trafficking between states and among states and beyond the region of South Asia. But we have not built up a regime in South Asia in addressing the issues of human trafficking that we all know exists and thrives. Similarly, South Asia is one of the most active regions in terms of drugs and violence trafficking, but our countries have not done any cooperation in these matters, but they affect the regional process of integration and cooperation. So issues of transnational security, issues of non-traditional security in South Asia have to be addressed. South Asia is extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and perhaps the frontline states of the regions of the world 
in terms of climate security, and those issues will need regional cooperation on security basis to address the issues of climate change. We are seeing that the region has become extremely vulnerable to the change in the international system that is taking place, particularly the end of the post-Cold War order that post-Cold War and the post-Second World War order that we have built for ourselves is perhaps crumbling. And South Asia needs to take note of those, particularly the security domain, to readjust itself. We see tremendous efforts by another rising superpower, China, to get involved in the region in terms of both its strategic engagement, its economic engagement. Therefore, South Asia wants, should find out ways of dealing with it, accommodating with it, and find out realistic solutions of building relationship within the region and beyond the region. I see tremendous prospect of a conflict that could engulf not only India, but the whole region if the Doklam conflict crisis erupts into conflict. And if we are unable to manage Doklam, then the prospect of a war looms very large over South Asia, perhaps the largest since the 1962 conflict between China and India. Therefore, those issues need to be addressed if we want to build a mutual environment of trust in the South Asian region. I see in the maritime space, new competition is taking place between India and China and many other countries beyond the region, especially as, in, as China gets more involved in BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. Most South Asian countries have already committed to BRI, including Bangladesh, including Sri Lanka, including Pakistan. Therefore, the region as a whole must find out a common stand because most countries are extremely keen to participate with BRI. Therefore, BRI is an issue that needs to be addressed as the regional body maybe find out a common approach how we are able to work and deal with BRI because it will be very, very difficult to bring out most South Asian countries out of BRI. The only country in the region that is not cooperating with BRI is India. So as a region, we've got to put our heads together and find out what we should do with BRI. But I see that there is a tremendous prospect for prospering out of the commitment that is coming out of BRI in terms of economic aid, in terms of infrastructure aid, in terms of the trade benefits, etc. So what should be done? What is the way forward? I'll just take one minute, Chairman, and just say the bullets I want to say without explanation. I feel that there has to be a total political commitment by the political leadership into the process, not the diplomatic commitment that we have seen so far. We need to include security as a point of deliberation within the SAR process. If not directly within the platform, maybe create a separate window, like the ARF, where we can bring our security issues, talk about them, and then bring back to the South platform. It is time for us to review the charter, to see whether it's still relevant in many of the processes, or we need to review and revise. We need to empower the Secretariat and the Secretary General to function as a functioning body. We need to engage with other regional bodies beyond the region like ASEAN and others. Therefore, we need to have a dialogue partnership process with many of the countries in the region that are and beyond the region who are already having an observer status. It is time for us also to think about whether we are going to upgrade some of our observer countries like China, like United States and many others who have shown interest in becoming a full member of South so that it becomes an expanded and a more powerful body which the South Charter, Charter allows. And the very last, we need a realist approach to SARC and not leave in denialability. It is my contention that we have got no better substitute to SARC. If we don't have another alternative or a substitute, it should be all our efforts and endeavor to make this organization a legal, functional, and a powerful organization for the region to prosper. I thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Mr. Mayor, you, uh, you both uh, bring up some very, very important uh, issues, of course, as uh, you must in your experience. Uh, uh, some of these are, are, are really almost outside the uh, domain of uh, what uh, the SAC leadership usually tend to engage, engage in. Uh, particularly, we bring up the issue of nuclear weapons. SARC is probably South Asia is the only region in the world, uh, region in the in regional organization, where member states have nuclear weapons aimed and targeted at each other's soft targets. Uh, there is no other region in the world where that exists. You made a passing mention, uh, mention in Afghanistan, the, the problem of tactical nuclear weapons, which is very real, because unlike strategic weapons, uh, tactical nuclear weapons are meant to be used and, and therefore uh, certainly lowers the threshold in a way uh, in a way that uh, that in other similar situations of conflict one has not quite seen so this is really a very dangerous place now this is exactly what think tanks like ISAS and COSAT consortium are meant to be I mean, these are not agenda items that governments will these, are, these do not constitute SARC agenda. But we as think tanks must focus on these peripheral issues which are really central to the central issues that SARC is involved in. In other words, issues of security that both our generals have raised are not something that we find a place in SARC uh, ministerial meetings or foreign secretary's meetings, etc. But it must find a, a, a place in, in, in the uh, the bump of uh, activities of institutes like ours, which must assist our political leaderships to engage themselves in a way that engagement leads to cooperation. Now, after the military talk, Ross, who I'm having a foreign office interview now, uh, uh, it seamlessly passes to a diplomat, uh, um, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Ambassador Mahmoud Tawhid Hussain, former foreign secretary of uh, Bangladesh, was my foreign secretary, uh, absolutely top to our diplomat. Let me see how he addresses some of the issues that his compatriot has raised and other issues as well. But uh, never mind. I mean, you say what you what you uh, what you meant to say, and I'm sure we'll have a very exciting deliberation of the talking session. Thank you, sir. Respected chair, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon to you all. I start just by with a very short. Comment. Uh, Given the devil is due, the British has done one good thing for India. They have unified the empire. Uh, the Indian empire never encompassed all that is India today. In fact, when uh, Nakamori and Lord Nathan were zero good from there, in its entire thousand or thousand years. Bangladesh, well, was on the periphery of the Indian empire. Not really part of the time. Truly, Punjab has been divided. It's perhaps the only thing that has been divided by the Indians. Okay, uh, coming back to our theme. The theme is that re energizing the South process, uh, this implies automatically that it is in a modern state uh, or dysfunctional state. Um, I think this is very truly so. Uh, since India declined to attend the 19th summit and very quickly Afghanistan and Bangladesh straight out from Ali. Followed suit, it became obvious that this hard process was facing a real serious setback. Pakistan postponed the summit initially and said that the new day would be announced, but then that did not come, and uh, that is unlike any time soon. To be honest, SARC in its 30 plus years has not achieved much. Let's accept that again. If we consider the level of integration with the SARC region, in spite of Signing the SAFTA in 93 and SAFTA in 2006, interregional trade has hovered around 5.6% uh, of the total international trade of the member countries. Well, the visa fee travel is usually a norm in regional grouping. In our case, the length of the visa forms and the line outside the embassy have only gone from longer to longer. It has not shortened. Uh, that excludes me and my wife because uh, because of provision in SARC, uh, I don't need visas to uh, travel within SARC countries all my life. Uh, but that is very limited uh, scope. The rest is uh, controversial. 
One utility of SART uh, that was initially highlighted was that uh, every year or later on, every two years, the heads of government of the not so friendly countries had the occasion to meet and speak to each other. And um, it is assumed that this, this helps in reducing tension. But uh, with summits being uncertain and with gaps between summits increasing, that scope is also not very limited or non existent. Uh, is South Asia better off as a regional today than it was in 1985? I don't think so. In 1985 at that time, Pakistan and India at least used to play cricket series in each other's country. It's not all that doing that. The limitations of SAR, as the chair had already pointed out at the beginning, uh, it was obvious from the very beginning because uh, Bangladesh floated the idea India and Pakistan, it's not only India, India and Pakistan both look at it with suspicion, as has been mentioned by the chair. And now the charter also ensured that the progress in SAR could be very slow. There was a rule of uh, unanimity. Even if one member did not agree, no decision could be taken. Even if one member would not participate, the meeting cannot take place. And uh, the organization also could not discuss any bilateral issue, even if that issue affected other members. The other stumbling block, which has been already pointed out by the, uh, my colleagues from military, uh, it was the India Pakistan country. That was a end for this organization. It's the colonial legacy that has brought down India Pakistan relations for the last 70 years. At independence, British India was divided into two states on the basis of religion. It's a religiously, it was a very religiously charged atmosphere. And it, Partition actually unleashed immense sufferings on millions of people uh, on both sides of the world. The departing British in their wisdom added a most bizarre provision in the Indian independence. This allowed the so-called rulers of the princely states who were neither independent before the British nor independent during the British rule, but they had the option to either join India or Pakistan or to remain independent irrespective of the religious composition or the wishes of their population. This is all known to you. In the short or medium term, therefore, I don't see any solution happening of the Kashmir problem, and so the associated difficulties continue to remain. There is also a third reason, in my opinion, for the lackluster performance of SAR. SAR as a grouping is different from other regional groups because of the reality that India has an ultra pivotal position in terms of area, population, size of the economy, and the geographical location also. All other members, some of them pretty large themselves in certain measures, are too small in comparison to India. Even taken together, they are nowhere near the size of India. In such a setting, it was essential that India took the leading role, both in attitude and in actual action, to carry the organization forward. Uh, Another participants are free to disagree with me, but in my observation during the last 30 years, India has not assumed or demonstrated the required leadership of SAR. The way more that India is, she needed to show some magnanimity. Instead, she was often too cautious, amiable, and sometimes downright obstructive. In such a grouping, smaller countries would normally expect to benefit from the large market of the overwhelming nature. In the case of SAR, Unfortunately, it has been rather way out. Coming to the main issue, how can the SAR process be re-energized or is it at all possible to re-energize the SAR process? As India declined to attend the SAR summit and almost all of the members stood by uh, to support India, holding of the summit has become absolutely uncertain. Pakistan cannot be expected to relinquish its term and allow some other country to host the summit. Since the summit cannot be held without the consent of each and every member, we can safely rule out the possibility of a such summit being held anytime soon. And so, the stalemate will continue. To restore the such process, the first key condition is therefore the following of relations between India and Pakistan. And to make the process vibrant, it's necessary that the resolution of the age of conflict between the two countries would, would be essential. What are the possibilities of that happening? 
Let us look at the political situation in both the countries. In India, a rightist party is in power with a clear mandate from the people. The party has in its hands and in its associated organizations a vast number of influential ultra rights and fanatics who can go to the extent of valuing bovine life over, over human life. This setup is unlikely to make any concession towards Pakistan, as softness would entail political loss eternally. Regionally, also, India is in a comfortable position with other countries of the group backing it up. On the other side, the state of Pakistan is in a serious turmoil. The military in Pakistan has always been breathing on the name of the politicians who never had the autonomy to take important policy decisions. Of late, the judiciary has joined their ranks to twist the political politicians' arms. The conflict with India is the raison the edge of the privileged position of the military in Pakistan. Resolution of the conflict with India, which in any case is difficult, is also not in their corporate interest. Uh, we must also remember that India-Pakistan issue is much more than a, just a border issue, unlike the India-China issue. In such a scenario, it is difficult to visualize Pakistan and India conflict being resolved, or the relations between the two countries arriving at a healthy working level in the near future. Uh, I am sorry if I am causing any discomfort to any optimists, but uh, let me say that in my reckoning, this art process is designed to remain dysfunctional for some time to come. And find no hope of re-energizing SARC process in India. Uh, the world will not, however, wait for India and Pakistan to resolve that. The possibilities remain for other forums to take up the job that SARC has failed to deliver. Uh, we have already mentioned that uh, we've seen that uh, except for Pakistan, Maldives, and Afghanistan, the other five countries are also members of the uh, BIMSTEC. Now, uh, BIMSTEC was started with four countries, in, and now later on it included Myanmar, Nepal, and Bhutan. So, um, uh, the growth of BIMSEC has also been very slow, I would say. It's quite some time that it has started because it's 20 years. Uh, we now have a secretary, we now have uh, uh, some, uh, you know, defining of the uh, role that, it, uh, or the areas that it, it needs to do. Uh, but uh, still, uh, the speed needs to be more. Uh, the major emphasis now is on trade, connectivity, uh, and investment. Uh, it also has less political work, unlike, unlike this art, which is an advantage. Now, uh, if we see that there is no rescue inside for SAR, BIMSTEC can perhaps uh, take the opportunity of becoming a vibrant organization, if the, of course, if the members so, uh, so desire. Uh, here again, the, I think the role of India will become crucial. Uh, being far, by far the largest economy, India will have to take the leadership uh, with a firm determination and enlightened self-interest as the guiding principle. Uh, Pakistan not being a part of it, it is a little bit easier for India to do so. But there are uh, one or two challenges. Uh, the first is an uneasy relation between Bangladesh and Myanmar over the ethnic situation in the Rakhine state. Now, successive governments in Myanmar have remained steadfast in their unannounced determination to cleanse the Rakhine state of its Rohingya minorities. In the last three decades, multiple episodes of atrocities have already driven out half of them out of Myanmar, mostly to Bangladesh, but also to some other countries in the region and beyond. This has created for Bangladesh immense social, ecological, and security problems. Uh, of late, some have also taken shelter in some of the regional countries, which is creating problems for them also. Myanmar has also persisted in its most irrational insistence that the Rohingyas are illegal migrants from Bangladesh. It needs a high level of imagination to conceive that anyone who chooses to immigrate to a place devoid of any city communities and in the midst of a hostile population. In their euphoria at the establishment of a quasi elective regime in Myanmar, the West chose to look the other way while the ethnic cleansing is slowly but definitely in progress. The celebrated Nobel laureate Aung San Suu Kyi has been a complete disappointment. Right at this moment, as we sit here, the Myanmar army is engaged in an operation, operation in the Rakhine state, and groups of Rohingyas are being driven across the border into Bangladesh. This is 
not an Ashkuri issue. Since there is no territorial claim from either side. So this issue can be resolved with some rational and human behavior from Myanmar. Uh, proactive persuasion from India and Thailand and some pressure from the international community would be helpful. <coughs> The second challenge, uh, I think, for the uh, main step collectivity to become a reality is the position of China. Collectivity uh, in real estate would automatically bring in connectivity with China because China is already connected to some of the main step countries. The connectivity will be extended if it takes place in real estate. Connectivity of China will be extended into Bangladesh and India. Connectivity will facilitate trade with the trade with an investment from China. It still might also require Chinese investment. This theoretically is a win-win situation. However, long-standing issues and current incidents between China and India threaten to avoid this. Would India like to see better connectivity between Bangladesh and China as a consequence of being connectivity? Either through India or through Myanmar directly. What would be the strategic implication of such connectivity? I think these are questions that need to be answered. Um, there is also one, uh, one other concern, which is that uh, how much serious Myanmar and Thailand would be in the progress of this? Because they are already part of ASEAN, which is a uh, hybrid organization. Uh, how much interest they would have in uh, getting the interstate process go forward. There are also some other initiatives, uh, either on the drawing board or in the intensity. The BCIM corridor has not progressed much. There is also the BBRN initiative. Uh, we have already spoken about this, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, and Bhutan. But uh, uh, this should have been very easy to uh, go ahead, but uh, we don't see much progress on it. Then on the, the mega project of Belt and Road, uh, India has uh, opted out uh, because one of the one of the routes was going through uh, the Pakistan administered Kashmir. Now, uh, if that remains a reason, that reason is uh, not going to be removed in foreseeable future. Uh, in that case, if that is the reason for India to stay out, then it is going to stay out. Um, now, of course, the uh, greatest, much greater significance strategically is the standoff between uh, the Indian and Chinese military. We have uh, our uh, military uh, colleagues have already touched upon. Uh, the two armies are face to face for the last two months already. The uh, Chinese are sometimes threatening action, although uh, no uh, shot has so far been fired, only some painting of stone. Um, but because they are so face-to-face uh, -face and uh, at any time there is a fear that uh, a conflict could take place. Of course, there are uh, uh, optimists who think that this will not take place because of our, uh, at least for one reason that uh, for China here, uh, uh, victory may not be assured because of the terrain, because of the locations, etc. And say a conflict takes place and then China is not able to resolve the Indian position, uh, then it becomes a loss of face for the Chinese. So, uh, that is a discouragement for China to uh, go into this uh, uh, position. And uh, then also there is the question of the huge uh, trade between uh, China and India. Uh, 71 billion in 2016 out of which 58 billion was Chinese exports to India. And who would like to uh, lose that market? So if good sense prevailed, I think uh, this conflict can be avoided. But uh, we must remember that good sense can never be guaranteed. Uh, okay, I'll stop abruptly. Just to sum up, there is, uh, in my opinion, there is no hope that this process can be uh, re-energized very soon. Uh, and uh, alternatives are there. Instead, uh, can be uh, BBIN, BCIN. This can uh, this can deliver. Uh, and the strategic uncertainty that has been created by China and India, we hope that uh, this will not uh, become a, a fighting war. Um, we all hope that uh, they will uh, see good sense and uh, will move into more, uh, more meaningful issues on uh, increasing connectivity and cooperation in the region. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you very much. You, you bring some uh, also important uh, subjects to the, to the table, including including the issue of the Rohingya, which can blow up at any moment. Uh, you will recall uh, for the event of the 8th of November and the 11th of November in 2008, uh, when we had given an ultimatum to, to Myanmar. And uh, at that point in time, we were prepared to fire the first shot. And there was no true opinion about it. And we had four ships speeding towards this uh, 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 to the, uh, a rig that was placed uh, by, by Burma, though it was not directly connected to Myanmar. Uh, when two people were we constantly in touch that day was uh, uh, Bernard Kushner, who was uh, the French Foreign Minister of the European Commission, and the chair of China throughout the day. And at 8 o'clock, Burma uh, uh, the rig and we called our ships back. Because we were prepared, unbeknownst to the rest of the world, Anyway, so this, this thing can happen in time. For him, the went to the power. Two occasions, I think, on the power of the Much of the world did not, and it was very difficult for me to communicate. He wasn't letting out hours of that. Extremely difficult. He managed under very difficult circumstances to avoid the war. Uh, two quick points, though. Uh, I, uh, I, when I mentioned uh, nuclear weapons, I was not for it or against it, because there are those who very effectively argue that the presence of nuclear weapons in the park and possession of nuclear weapons in the parts of India and Pakistan does stabilize, stabilize the situation. I'm not saying uh, uh, it, it's destabilizing at all. I'm saying that tactical nuclear weapons have the potentials of destabilizations, but it has not happened so far. Uh, the Pakistani military is not represented here, but uh, we will have uh, General Karamat uh, um, on the 25th, and I'm sure he will tell us, uh, as he does, that uh, in uh, Pakistani military, as you said, it beats down the neck of the civil politicians. But in Pakistani military, it may be seen by some to be representing the broad ethos of the people. I mean, the, the political leaders, they will argue, some will argue, represent the Taliban, uh, is, uh, represent uh, feuders, whereas the military could be rep mirroring the, uh, the, uh, the popular ethos. This is just a point of view, but this is a point of view that General uh, Karamat makes and he will possibly make on the 25th. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tawhid. I'll move on to the next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Dinusha uh, uh She is uh, the executive director of the Lakshman Kadegama. Institute of International Relations and Strategic, uh, Strategic Studies, uh, with uh, which we are looking to a very cooperative relationship in the times to come. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to ISAS um, for, for hosting this event, uh, to Dr. Sunday for the invitation, and to the Conrad Adenauer Foundation for uh, this important event. Uh, since uh, our lawyer, I'll begin with a brief disclaimer, uh, which uh, is to say that, of course, my uh, views expressed today are, are personal observations, uh, not official views. Um, Rav Khan has suggested that I speak about the regional strategic context from a Sri Lankan perspective, uh, and that's what I hope to do today, and I would like to do so by discussing three related questions. Firstly, what is the current government's thinking uh, on Sri Lanka's role in the region. Uh, secondly, what are some key challenges Sri Lanka faces in realizing that potential role in the region? Uh, and thirdly, uh, how might Sri Lanka uh, address these challenges? Now, each of these three aspects uh, were extensively discussed and debated, debated at a recent uh, foreign policy forum that the Latin Kavigam Institute hosted in June. Uh, which was the first major foreign policy conference in Sri Lanka in many years. Uh, so I thought it would be useful for those of you gathered here today to, for me to perhaps summarize the main themes of those who spoke at the conference. There were uh, about 20 speakers, mostly local, including senior representatives of the foreign ministry. What was interesting is that over the two days of the forum, we barely heard the term SARC. 
could count them on one hand. Uh, we heard a lot about India, quite a lot about China, uh, and uh, RCEP as a potential organizational framework about uh, uh, Iora and the Indian Ocean region, um, about even the online movement, of course, uh, the, uh, the change situation in the US, uh, but, and a lot about the need to focus on economic diplomacy. Uh, but, but very, very little about SARC. Um, a little bit about South Asia, but the term SARC, I'm not really sure it was mentioned at all. Uh, perhaps once or twice uh, in, in, in the um, section on, on maritime security. Uh, whether the, the lack of references to SARC was accidental or revealing, uh, perhaps I would leave you to consider after I have discussed these three questions that I, I mentioned. So the first one was, what is the government's uh, thinking on Sri Lanka's role in the region and how that is evolving. So for some time, uh, Sri Lanka was viewed as a small uh, South Asian country with uh, good social indicators, uh, but however, economic dependency on the West. However, there has been a noticeable shift in that thinking in the last couple of years, since 2015, in two ways. Firstly, the government has articulated, um, uh, if you like, a different branding of Sri Lanka as um, uh, not at the bottom of a region, uh, the bottom of South Asia, uh, at the pit of South Asia, but rather as a center. So the branding is to see it as a center of the Indian Ocean region, uh, and in particular, to build it as a center between Dubai and Singapore. Uh, this, the, the second type of uh, shift, and it, it, it's almost a, this, the second ring of this identity, is to see Sri Lanka as an economic gateway to the Indian subcontinent. In a way, the opener, not the end, right? The uh, uh, the arrivals lounge, not the departure lounge. Uh, so this re-envisioning is being driven by a desire to take better advantage of Sri Lanka's, Sri Lanka's strategic location in the Indian Ocean, Ocean, given global economic trends. So it was noted during the Foreign Policy Forum that China is now the world's largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity, and meanwhile, India is predicted to overtake the US as the world's second largest economy in PPP terms by 2050. So with this shift from economic power from the West to the East, the Indian Ocean has grown rapidly in strategic importance. Maritime traffic in the Indian Ocean has increased by nearly 400% over the last decade. Uh, with about 50% of global container traffic and nearly 80% of the world's seaborne oil now passing through the sea lanes of the Indian Ocean. A fact that is of particular significance for Sri Lanka given its island location. Uh, the rising giants, China and India, are of course competing for control over these energy and trade flows. Uh, China through the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and India via its Act East policy. So Sri Lanka has seen other smaller states capitalize on this shift uh, and uh, position themselves very successfully, as uh, Dubai and Singapore have done, as logistical and financial hubs. Uh, so therefore, taking these factors into account, the Prime Minister uh, has articulated on several occasions his vision, the government's vision, to develop Sri Lanka as the next center of the Indian Ocean with first-class maritime ports that can continue to attract maritime traffic despite significant growing competition, and to develop Colombo as an international financial city, the so-called IFC, uh, that can attract foreign investment, model than the Dubai model with a separate legal framework. Um, so that's a hub idea. On the gateway to the Indian subcontinent idea, something that is more, as well, relevant to SARC, uh, the Prime Minister has articulated that 
uh, Sri Lanka should see itself as a gateway to the five southern states of India, uh, including Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and Kerala. Uh, these states have a total population of 250 million people and a GDP of 400 billion. So, with Sri Lanka, that would uh, let raise it to a regional GDP of five of 500. So you would have noticed that this reconceptualization of Sri Lanka from being at the bottom of South Asia to the center and the gateway is all economically correct. Um, and that raises um, a broader point about what kind of diplomacy Sri Lanka is emphasizing now, moving away to traditional diplomacy. The term of the day in Sri Lanka is economic diplomacy, uh, prioritizing uh, expansion of trade, investment, and tourism. So this focus on economic diplomacy may explain the lack of discussion about SARC at the Foreign Policy Forum. Given the evident failure of SARC initiatives, including SAFTA and SAFTA, to promote regional economic integration. While South Asia is, as was pointed out, the fastest growing economic region in the world, uh, it is seen as most unhelpful that intra-regional trade uh, stands at a mid of 26 billion uh, compared to the 447 billion within ASEAN. Uh, so if, I, if you can sort of summarize this, this, this shift, it's, uh, it's almost like watching a, a child move out of the family home. Uh, it's, uh, you know, th this is its family. Childish is its family, it's its heritage. It will always feel connected. It will always want it to succeed. But we have seen decades of it not succeeding. And, uh, uh, and it's, it's the word dysfunctional was mentioned earlier. Um, it is like watching constantly squabbling parents who are very smart and very able, but you just can't handle the fighting anymore. And you really want you know, a bigger, better family somewhere else and marry into one perhaps while you keep your original family there and hope to come back to it someday. Uh, and Singapore is a very good example of, of uh, a, a small country that built its economic prosperity with other alliances and came back actually to help ASEAN grow economically. This is uh, something that perhaps could be, uh, Sri Lanka might see so as doing as well. Um, so in the meantime, our objective is perhaps to see uh, uh, these squabbling parents not mortally injure each other, to look out for our siblings uh, you know, and, and help them, but we want a brighter future beyond the family shores. So, what are the issues and challenges to Sri Lanka realizing this vision? And, and here we'll see actually that you know, moving out is not so easy and that we need to actually be somewhat invested, keep invested in the family as well. Uh, so uh, th there are basically four uh, major challenges and, and which indicate we should be a bit hesitant to turn our, our focus away from the South family. The first is um, uh, we haven't quite sorted out the, the frameworks of our foreign policy. I mean, yes, we talk a lot about economic diplomacy, but there's some, some major sort of framework issues that we're still grappling with. There are security issues that are lurking in the background that are no longer at the forefront, but still that we have to remain cognizant of. Uh, there are um, uh, regulatory issues that are uh, causing an obstacle to this uh, economic uh, agenda uh, that uh, the, the, of this new foreign policy. And there are resource issues, particularly personnel issues. Uh, so just to, just to give you sort of an idea of the key challenge under each of these categories, with regard to the framework issues, we might want to possess, position ourselves as the center, uh, but with the rise of China and India both competing for dominance, how does Sri Lanka really position itself between these two? Truly at the center, of these two actors, bearing in mind also the continuing predominance of the U.S., uh, which can be continued to, uh, which is expected to continue uh, for the at least for the next few decades. How does it guard against economic investment by China without that translating into strategic or even military influence? Uh, if we're to be a center, that is a good question. 
if it wants, and second, if it wants to become the economic gateway, this is that second branding to the subcontinent, how is it going to achieve that gateway, especially integration with South India, when there remains deep public antipathy towards India? There was a very interesting poll um, published by Lanka Monthly Digest uh, uh, just last week, uh, where uh, the people who had been asked um, whether they believe China is the key to Sri Lanka's progress or India is the key to Sri Lanka's progress. 72% of Sri Lankans polled believe that China was the key to Sri Lanka's progress. Only 42% said the same of India. Uh, and in a second statement, 28% agrees with the statement that India can be relied on in the long term. So a quarter. When the same question was asked in China, about half, 51% said China can be relied on in the long term. So that's quite revealing in terms of how we build um, this gateway to, to southern India. Uh, there was one speaker who made a very valuable and uh, uh, suggestion of you know, why aren't we building the bridge to India, which uh, when we tweeted that and it was on Facebook, turned into, uh, we saw uh, uh, a bridge as in a bridge, not like the wall of <laughs> <laughs> The opposite of the wall, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, so, so the bridge uh, to southern India, which was raised, uh, by the causeway was raised by the government at the very, very beginning uh, of its term in 2015, but no one dares mention it any longer. Um, in the post-war, so that's, that's the framework issue that we have to grapple with. With the security issues, um, uh, we don't have sort of immediate security threats, but uh, lots of experts here have spoken uh, compellingly about the threat of radicalization uh, and extremism. What about the adverse effects of climate change, uh, which have also been mentioned, and the external security threats. So as much as we want to take forward this notion of economic diplomacy, we still have to realize that the foundation of that is uh, in a, con uh, a stable security uh, scenario. Um, Sri Lanka, the, the third issue is regulatory challenges. How are we going to achieve this idea of being a hub where we have uh, a very low ranking on the annual ease of doing business index? Um, it, it has dropped every year since 2013. 2013, we were 81st in the world. Now we're actually ranked 110 countries, so this government is actually doing worse. It, uh, than uh, the previous government. Uh, it's uh, lower than some South Asian countries, including Nepal and, and Bhutan. Um, and fourth, in terms of, of resources, if you're looking to be a hub, you have to have qualified international lawyers, you can speak different languages. Uh, this, this is a, a huge challenge for Sri Lanka, given that in during the conflict years, we had resources in exodus of people out uh, to other countries. So all these above issues come to the specifics of this aim to become um, a successful center of the Indian Ocean. And that suggests, perhaps, that, uh, that Sri Lanka really does need to stay, have its eye on South Asia. It can't turn away. It needs to uh, uh, think about uh, strengthening it, and it and it sh and that would uh, prove fruit fruitful in the long run. Um, how might uh, Sri Lanka address these issues and challenges? Well, there were lots of ideas suggested before, but I'll I'll, I'll mention some others I, uh, that I, I think would be more relevant to to, to South countries. Um, Starting with a very, very specific one, which has come up recently. Uh, Sri Lanka has very poor timings for airport landings. Those of you who have come from Sri Lanka know that you arrive at 2 a.m. and the flight out is at 5 a.m. And I'm sure this is a similar issue in some of the, uh, the other South Asian countries. So, uh, you know, East Asia has grabbed really good times. Middle East has grabbed really good times. If South Asia wants to to, to get those times, it's going to have to work together to get that, because no one country is going to be able to do that on its own, and it, it is very important for, for trade and tourism. 
So, so that's just a, a small practical uh, suggestion. Uh, there, there was a lot of discussion before about Sri Lanka um, being taking more of a, a stand for intellectual openness, especially in the current context of media freedom, that we should be a, an articulator of values, um, of, uh, of open thinking. Um, there's some potential here for, for playing a role within South Asia. So uh, very usefully there was discussed that starting a, com uh, a comparative to the Erasmus program, the exchange program, and certainly university level exchanges uh, would be useful. We perhaps, given the, the, given the issues around universities, uh, sometimes we have seen the South Asian Medical University uh, causing some controversy uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, I think it might be useful to start at a pre-university level at the school level. So there are some school-to-school -school connections. Individual schools have individual exchange programs, but you almost need to get, get them early, uh, if you like. And one way of doing that is uh, something we discussed briefly last night, is having perhaps a leadership academy, sort of like the United World College model of you know, the 15 to 18 year olds. It's a boarding school. It's for uh, the, the brightest of students. Uh, this is something I think Sri Lanka should actually invest in post in because uh, if you get the brightest uh, students like the African Leadership Academy, which is a good model, uh, it's an uh, organization of African Union idea. Uh, uh, if, we, if we do that, then uh, you know, the, the best and brightest will, will come to Sri Lanka from all around the region. If there's so much you can do, you can have them learn another South Asian language, uh, interact, you can develop like you have Model UN, you can have Model SARC, uh, and there's lots of different things that, that, that could be done at, at that age group, and then they'll probably go out to the best universities and hopefully they'll come back to Colombo or come back to Sri Lanka, but at least our hope is that they will come back to the region and help develop it. Um, uh, another, uh, uh, just a, a, a very small idea, we, we talked earlier about art and the world of art, and um, museums and culture, it might be difficult to have connectivity in museums uh, organized by South. But what we're seeing in the Middle East could be a model in South Asia, and that is that well-funded Western cultural institutions like the Guggenheim, Louvre, actually move in and create, fund their own art museums and have almost a branch network of art museums. Uh, you know, uh, South Asian countries have such rich cultural artifacts that they're unlikely to want to send them to other countries without an intermediary. So these, uh, these uh, well-funded international uh, cultural institutions might be a, a way of doing that and, uh, and sh being able to show each country the heritage of, of, of the other. Um, uh, we've seen the Prime Minister discuss more on a, on a broader level of Sri Lanka taking a, a, a reinvigorating the 1971 UN resolution for an Indian Ocean Zone of Peace. Um, whether or not that's done within SART or outside of SART. 1971. Uh, yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, a model, I think, is, is the New Zealand uh, campaign in the 1980s and 1990s to declare. South Pacific, uh, a nuclear free zone, and that could be something that. Uh, Rotonga. Rotonga, exactly, with the French, uh, the French testing. So uh, that, that was quite a successful model. So um, you know, I think Sri Lanka would be happy to support those kind of initiatives um, within the, the South Asian region. Uh, climate change has already been mentioned as a potential area of cooperation. Uh, the ADB recently reported that South Asia could lose an equivalent of 1.8% of its GDP uh, annually by 2050, and Sri Lanka and Bangladesh would lose even more, up to 2% uh, of their GDP. So there's, there's incentives there to uh, cooperate. Um, on issues of skilled personnel, South Asian countries share a history of um, extensive diasporas. Uh, is there, I know there's a, a, a large conference organized around this issue, but is there more that can be done to share knowledge about how we leverage them back for countries? Uh, could this be turned into a, a sort of a, a more council of 
senior di South Asian diaspora or different countries who can work together to help South and South the South Asian countries. Uh, my final observation is um, really about it's on bureaucracy and, and, and who's sitting in this uh, perhaps who's sitting in this room. It was mentioned earlier if governments are unable to lead, let's bring in the people. Um, and someone else, uh, another expert said, you must become people centric. Um, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. And, and to that, I would say, if governments are unable to lead, let's bring in the people and let's bring in the entrepreneurs. Let's bring in the private sector, the people who are actually job creators into this discussion. Because everyone has pointed out the huge economic potential, the huge economic growth. They're not different from people. I mean, when we say people, we mean them as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So there's such talented entrepreneurs, uh, and in South Asian economy, the growing s at the, at the fastest in the world. That's saying something not just about demographics, but also about private sector capacity. Um, telling me on a form I saw about who was entitled to the South visa waivers, I, I, it was very interesting because it gave a list of who's entitled to South visa waivers. You know, foreign secretaries, uh, ministers, uh, but not job creators. Yeah, you know, okay. uh, so the, where are the, how are we prioritizing business in this who are doing so well already? So they might have some like, practical and innovative ideas on how perhaps to deregulate and practically move SARC along. Uh, so, and until the South economy gets moving, the rest of the South membership is not going to be that excited about joining it anyway. So perhaps they can be a leading force, drive it further, and once the economics is successful, you know, then it becomes self-sustaining as an organization. And we've seen that in the last episode. So that's a, that's more. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very useful. Uh, yeah, the list does include businessmen also, but the problem is if a businessman or entrepreneur has been in the army, for instance, uh, we, we cannot exclude our generals from profit, uh, profit earning activities, but that creates a problem because they fall foul of other South groups. No, very good. I think uh, uh, you might be asked questions on what kind of model uh, SARP you want to teach in your schools. Uh, judging from what we have heard in the past hour and a half or so, uh, model SARC is not an ideal subject. Uh, in model UN maybe, but model SARC in our schools, yes, there is room to improve, improve all that curriculum. Uh, I, I expect, by the way, I mean, I think it has been mentioned before, someone must have mentioned it, we want the participants to submit their presentations in the form of articles so that they find uh, fruition in some kind of a uh, book of a production which, uh, which uh, uh, Michelle and I will uh, look at. So I hope this is, this is more of the That's the idea, isn't it? Okay. All right. I will open the floor for question and answers. Make the questions short or make the questions in such a way that you expect a short answer. <laughs> that is more important than the length of your question. Uh, okay. Uh, Anish, I'll recognize you, but you know the rules. I mean, you have to identify yourself, uh, and, and you have to keep yourself... Uh, uh. Okay, Anish. Okay, uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Anish Mishra. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to thank the panel for a brilliant presentation. I was particularly uh, impressed with uh, Major General's um, Muni Zaman's presentation. Therefore, my question is directed to you. So, um, General, uh, so you agree with me that there are actually four main, main factors which are actually the, um, the roadblocks to regional cooperation in South Asia. And these four factors is firstly uh, the, the, the Kashmir dispute. And when I say Kashmir dispute, I'm referring to, to that road in uh, Gilgit, Baltistan. The, the second, second one is on state or space, state sponsored terrorism. You see, the problem with terrorism in South Asia is that. The, the terrorists of one country is actually the freedom fighter of another country. You will see, you know, Pakistan's position on the Hezbollah Mujahideen, as well as, you know, um, remember last year, last year at the Great Fort, uh, Narendra Modi spoke about Balochistan. 
So, so that is just one point. I'm just keeping short. The, the third is that I think South, South, especially India, it has the it does not has the ability to differentiate between the multilateral and the bilateral. You see, I'm referring to the to the boycott of the South summit that took place in, that took place in Islamabad. Bangladesh is also a culprit here because you know when when Pakistan condemned the the, the hang of the of the war criminals, Bangladesh chose to to boycott the South summit because of a bilateral issue. So I think um, some countries need to develop the ability to differentiate between bilateral and multilateral. Having said that, I think Pakistan has the ability to do that because after the South summit was boycotted, Sardar Shazi still attended the Heart, Heart of Asia conference in uh, Amritsar and the Indians refused to bring him to the Golden Temple. Okay, the, the third um, and, and the, 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 last, the last factor here is that the Indian, Indian, Indian hegemonic designs as well as the Sino-Indian rivalry. This is also a factor that actually, um, that actually has been a hindrance to regional cooperation in SARC. One solution maybe is to have a, a SARC with, without India but with China in it. So I mean this, this can be an option because you know, coming forward we need to think of alternatives. I, I, I've noted that every SARC country have understood the importance of regional cooperation. But the thing is that and you all have also recognized that SARC is sadly one of the world's most dysfunctional regional organizations. Thus, there's a need to find alternatives. And maybe, you know, I, I would like to hear from the panel some alternatives. Thank you, Amanda. All right. I, I, this Indian hegemony is interested in a near regional. We can have the wrong general. We can have the wrong general. Okay. Thank you, Anis. Uh, the points that you raise have all been raised by me otherwise. I am saying that there is unresolved disputes like Kashmir and many others. They need to be resolved. You also mentioned about harboring terrorists and acquisitions and counter acquisitions. That is also a given fact of life. You talk about multilateral and bilateral. That is a point that I also mentioned here because I also say that uh, when uh, these are utilized for killing a summit, sometimes they are proxies. The bigger player in the room does not say what it wants to say, but uses countries like Bangladesh, Bhutan, or Nepal to say what it wanted to say. So use of proxies or coercive measures to use those voices must stop. What is most concerning here is the developing relationship between India and China. Because of the changing nature of the international system, as the chair did mention, that there is a space in the strategic space that has been created by the post Trump era. And naturally, the biggest player in the region, China, is trying to fill it up. So there is a rapid expansion of Chinese footprint in South Asia. We already had a Chinese footprint, but the footprint is rapidly expanding given also the fact that it is the only country in the world that has money. No other country has money. So when the Sri Lankans went to the Indians to build the Hamantota port as the right of first uh, acceptance, it came back empty-handed, so China filled it up. So in the same manner, China is rapidly expanding its footprint in South Asia. South Asia, particularly India, will have to find out mechanisms how to deal with it or cope with it because most South Asians, unfortunately or fortunately, as Dinesh pointed out, the survey results, that is exactly the survey results in Bangladesh. If you ask Bangladeshis, who is your real friend, majority will say China. And those are the results we are getting from our surveys. And that's why I said when we deal with regional cooperation, we must take a realist path and see how it really is evolving in the region. Something has gone wrong in the bilateral relationship between the biggest player in the region and the smaller players. And we need to take a realist approach in seeing those realities. Thank you. Okay, um, I will now, uh, yeah, in, in, in clusters, by the way, of three uh, key questions, uh, I will recognize um, in, in this order Professor Subrata Mitra, Mr. Javed Barki, Dr. Malika Joseph, Sir, uh, 
uh, later, but the first three uh, members of the council. In this order, Professor Mitra, uh, Mr. Berkey, and those are the uh, sort of participants can raise your flag. I'm a political scientist by profession and again theorist by training. The voices, the voices are here. Show me how hard it is going to be to fulfill the agenda we have set for this group. And we have to come up with something concrete, and I agree with the chair that concrete result must appear in the form of a book because ultimately we are beholden to the taxpayers in Germany and Singapore for uh, the happy times we are having now. Because they are the ones who have funded this particular conference. We have to show some concrete results. As a political scientist, I can understand how the Modi government has disappointed the neighbors. That it was expected that after the announcement of Modi in the presence of all the South Asian prime ministers, it would be a happy walk towards South Asian integration. It didn't happen. That's where game theory strives. Think of, I am focusing myself, I'll be very brief, I am focusing myself on the, the um, magnificent statement of uh, Foreign Secretary Thiru Fusen that enlightened self-interest should push India to a leadership. Why didn't it? Let me put it this way. Modi has not only become the Prime Minister of India, his party is winning election after election. One doesn't realize how fragile that power is. It's a democracy where one bad showing can have a further effect, a chain reaction, and it can all fizzle down. So, Modi is trapped into being Modi, which is to show India is a strong power. Now, a strong power would mean every country has a trauma. The Indian trauma is 1962 and the Pakistani trauma is 1971. And people remember that you have to stand up to China and that is what is happening. Here is a statement from Lieutenant General Katosh. He says that the Modi government policy was clear and well articulated with regard to China. Then here is a quote. The government policy is very, very clear now. This is not 1962. A respectable solution is mutually acceptable withdrawal. And he says about the Doklam standoff. For once, the defense establishment and political authorities are firm. The ball is in the Chinese court. Now, we have never seen anything like that before. The Indian Army never took a political position. Now it is strongly siding with the government. And these are meant for the consumption of the Indian voter. Similarly, the South Asian neighbors of China underestimate the impact of terrorist strikes in India. Though it's not Pakistani government policy to harbor terrorists, the fact remains that that is where they are coming from. And I have given earlier the example of when cooperation happens between two partners and how it's broken up by a third party intervening, which destroys trust between the two. The terrorists are not under the power of the Pakistani government, but the fact that they come from Pakistan destroys the trust that could grow. Let us not forget that the first major initiative of trust building between India and Pakistan was taken by a BJP government, by Baj by taking a bus to Lahore, and the second attempt was made by Modi, in inviting Prime Minister Sharif and then again going to Prime Minister Sharif's home to congratulate him on his birthday. Why are these initiatives not going further? The answer is the perception in India of terrorism, the perception in India of distrust has an equal effect and it hardens the determination of the bunker mentality that India is developing. Now, I had two, a great respect for two Pakistani economists. One was Mehbubul Haq, the other is Mr. Berkey. Both have shown the peace dividend and how much individual South Asian countries could benefit, including India, from trade. So, why do people not see these figures? The answer is 
security comes before trade, and India feels insecure in the north as well as from terrorism within India. Now, this is what is creating a very dangerous thing, a kind of bunker mentality in India, and they are bunkering in, and that could make building of some exactly what this conference is aimed at so much harder. I agree with uh, the Foreign Secretary about the pessimism that is emerging from among the participants, which is why I'll end by saying how much, how much I'm encouraged by what I hear from Dr. Dhanusha Panditaratne, a country looking out for itself and taking the best offer. That's exactly what Sri Lanka is doing. That's exactly what Singapore has always done. And that, I think, is the kind of enlightened self-interest that we do it. And that has to come, not just from India, but from across South Asia. And let us be realistic. Let's realize, like North Korea has the bomb, India, in Delhi, has the Hindu nationalists in power. And these Hindu nationalists are determined to make up for the trauma that Indians have suffered, the kind of lack of, uh, kind of, um, insecurity and inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis China and that is what is moving India. That South Asia mind integrate could be a byproduct with collective effort on cannot look towards India for that kind of unilateralism which India at one point had adopted as policy from the Gujarat doctrine. That is over. Now India will react only as a part of a collective effort not unilateral Indian effort towards paying for a South Asian leadership. That India will not do. Are you reacting to this or are you asking to this? Yeah, well, I have a question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, reflecting on, as an economist, since you identify me as such, uh, I can think of four or five reasons why, over time, countries around the world have opted for regional approach to public policy making. But I won't go into that. That's a subject for another time. Uh, I was intrigued by one thing uh, that several presenters talked about. Uh, the subject over here is re-energizing the SARC process. But a number of uh, presentations talked about sub-regional arrangements. My question is, uh, sub-regional arrangement in the context of SARC is a pop-up. Uh, and uh, as uh, the Foreign Secretary was saying, SARC is dysfunctional, it is not making progress, uh, frustration particularly uh, by the smaller countries and so on. To a certain extent, India's uh, uh, desire to exclude Pakistan and therefore without out arrangements with other countries the question that I have is that if we are advocating or supporting or encouraging the formation of sub-regional arrangements, we are then deviating and moving away from a regional concept, uh, a concept in which South Asia, all eight countries, would work together. Uh, I've been saying for some time now that given what Trump is doing, to America, what Trump is doing uh, to the global economic order. Unless South Asians work together as South Asia, they are going to lose out. And I'll uh, say a bit about this when I get to chair my uh, next session. My view is that let's not go for sub regional arrangements. Let's concentrate all our attention to making SARC possible. Several people have talked about how important it is to have a critical commitment on the part of the large country to do that. That's important. So by uh, going in for sub-regional arrangements, even you know, somebody mentioned uh, Shanghai cooperation organizations and so forth, these are deviations from the main task. The main task is to get South Asia to work together and not as individual countries uh, more, more often than not working against one another. Okay. Uh,
Hi. Um, I couldn't uh, agree with Ambassador Bukhi more on uh, what he talked about uh, the move towards sub regionalism and how it goes against the larger tenets of uh, you know, regional organization at all. And especially when you see that, um, I mean, we'll be discussing further in the next sessions, like how successful have these sub regional initiatives aimed at being? So, what has been the purpose? So, we'll come to that in the next session. Uh, but just I want to react to uh, some questions and comments that came about earlier. Uh, two things. Uh, one, uh, we talk about uh, SARC as a um, as a institution which is not delivered, which is not working. Uh, but do we look at which uh, any other country which is as large, where there is uh, such asymmetry in size and which has got disputed borders, as like in South Asia with specific reference to India? Uh, where else do you find? Like, do you find China inside a regional organization? Do you find the U.S.? Do you find Russia? You don't. So uh, when we look at that, I mean, when, uh, many times SARC is compared either to EU, where you've had two nations which have been fighting together, which are now able to cooperate, or it's uh, compared to ASEAN. But look at where any of your big powers are, are, and look at where India wants to aspire. Whether its aspirations are true or not is another debatable question. But in that context, where, where do we find the other countries like China or US or Russia being part of a regional uh, architecture where it's working. So I think that needs to be the comparison for us. And uh, secondly, the other question is, uh, we talk about uh, how the bickering between India and uh, Pakistan has constantly stalled SARC as uh, that is the main reason why SARC hasn't taken off. My counter question is, forget India and Pakistan, what have together the other states achieved within South Asia. They could have cooperated, they could have come together to coerce India and Pakistan to do something, right? But forget about it, coercing India and Pakistan to do something, but what have they done even economically? Most of their trade partnership is with ASEAN or with other countries. They haven't developed relationships within, economic relationships within South Asia. Why is that? I mean, so uh, many times we look at the India-Pakistan equation and we forget about the different equations which are absent below that in SARC and I think that needs to be looked at. And why I bring that also is about uh, what um, uh, Mr. Mitra talked about on uh, game theory. It's like stag hunt. Either you all cooperate and you get the big, you know, the venison down or you go home happy with the hair. So it depends on whether uh, the other the rest of South Asian countries would like to ignore India and Pakistan and say hell with them, but we can cooperate. I mean, things like uh, connections. Most of the c countries are still dependent on India, and they say India is this big dividing factor. Right, let that be, set it aside, but can't you have connections directly with the other South Asian countries? We still don't have direct flights. So things like that are possible to look at and explore. Just one uh, reaction to the Haman Pota, uh, Haman uh, Pota port that you, meant, uh, you mentioned about how uh, the Indians, even in the context of money not being available, but the point was not the money. It was because it was economically not a viable port to begin with. And secondly, after the Chinese gave them a whole lot of loan and did the port, they said that the port had to be dredged because it had a lot of rocks. It's not something surprising. They would not have known before they invested or made uh, Sri Lanka invest all that money on the port. And at the end of it, Sri Lanka is unable to pay the loan and instead they had to give it as uh, 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 stocks to the Chinese, which is essentially giving up a little bit of a sovereign thing for what you wanted. And the Colombo port is not over congested as well, because uh, uh, the bulk of Colombo port's uh, revenues or work is basically bulk breaking for India. So there aren't others who are coming in there as a port, the viability of the port. So there are a lot of, there are larger questions behind Haman Tota, beyond just whether India had the money or not. Knowing well, if India had done it, it would have been more uh, as an aid or a partnership rather than a loan. That makes a big difference for a country like Sri Lanka, which has got into a, a debt trap with China. Thank you. Okay, maybe we take uh, two more and we uh, sort of take a basket of uh, questions and react to this in the end. Thank you, Chair. I'm Chair Sri Priyalal from Uni Global Union. Uh, basically, I'm a trade unionist. Uh, well, thank you very much for all the panelists uh, for your contributions. 
Well, I've been uh, working in this region for quite a long time. Uh, and of course, uh, we uh, always facilitate movement of people from all these countries. Uh, so many of you have mentioned the word connectivity and SARC being the people-centric organization. Well, uh, when we are in things, uh, we have always these problems of taking people from India to Pakistan, the visa matter, so we always choose either Kathmandu or Colombo so that everybody can. But yet, connectivity. There are no direct flights. Right? So, just to start with, uh, I think uh, if our whole thinking is to re energize. And then, I think uh, you mentioned, you know, in the past, how successful or prosperous South Asia had been in the past. And all our prosperity was uh, divided based on foreign invention, various forms. But now we find the same fact. There is a need for all South Asians to unite because there is also challenges from foreign uh, parties. What is lacking here is trust. And to build this trust, I think Dinusha mentioned it very correctly, the business community, they should take the lead. Because they will have some ownership into the whatever the things that be. Otherwise, at political level, diplomatic level, we will have all these things, but there is no ownership which will take things further. So for this to happen, to facilitate movement of people for economic, social, cultural needs, I think at least between the capitals, I know, I mean daily flights will not be possible, at least once a week flight from capital to capital can start. To revitalize the summit, what you have mentioned, we have to begin somewhere. If it is physically impossible to have this for political reason, at least try to have a virtual conference making use of the technology to begin with. Because we cannot leave this as it is and uh, move further forward. Because I find Chinese BRI is a factor for all the South region countries to unite. And because the economic benefit, what is going to derive is going to be high for everyone to benefit. Because China has money, that's one thing, but they have put a strategy and a structure in the right place. Okay. So, all right. Is that the point to make? Point taken? Uh, last intervention. Good point. And, and the virtual conference was a good point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Anis Subhak. I'm the Deputy High Commissioner from Bangladesh High Commission. And I also have a very unfortunate identity, which is representing at the Programming Committee meetings in 2015 and 2016. This is the Joint Secretary's Committee. Um, now, my first question will be directed to General Munir, given that you referred to some kind of, you suggested for some kind of uh, improvement in the SARC, SARC processes. Uh, and also because of my own experience in sitting at the programming committee meetings where for two years in 2015 and 16 we discussed only how to approve the budget of the secretariat and also how to curtail all the budgets of um, regional centers and package stories and no substantive talks at all and we very successfully and I'm telling it successfully because it's a consensus decision with the programming committee members very successfully cut down every possibility of any substantive talks uh, during those two years. So my question will be, do you have any specific uh, suggestion as to how to improve the such process itself? And my sex, um, the second question will be directed to Dr. Inusha Pandiyaratna. And it's also because of my own experience uh, when your proposition of bringing it to People Center. Um, we also successfully cut it at the very beginning when this proposal was raised. And the proposal was raised by the Secretariat. 
and um, it was uh, actually, if I'm not wrong, it was proposed by one of the directors who was representing India. And since it's within these four worlds, it was Indian programming committee member who was first to cut the proposal at the very beginning of bringing people to drive the SAP process rather than the um, sovereign states and state representatives. So, so, do you have any specific recommendation or suggestion as to how um, this people-centric or people-driven process can be uh, bring into uh, Jago bypassing the barriers like programming content for the uh, standing committee? Okay, Anish, uh, all right, we, we may react to it. Starting with Dr. Anisha, we go around the table. And Yeah, actually, yeah, I'm not sure when, at what point this was rejected by India, but my, my comment was really to agree with uh, an earlier call, uh, I believe, by the chair uh, on for a, a people-centric uh, process, and to add to that by saying that... Not people-centric, people's side. A people's side, sorry. Uh, and to add to that by, by specifying the importance of the private sector, and thank you very much for the clarification. But that's because they're already invested, and perhaps that the companies to start with are the companies that have investments in other SAR countries. So you take, I mean, uh, there's, there's a, I can sort of name a couple at the top of my head from Sri Lanka who have very big investments in Bangladesh. You know, that's, they would then, okay, for them, they're looking to go to Bangladesh, maybe India, so those are the people you want on the table because that they want this openness uh, to happen. Um, I think Malika made very good points about you know, what, what, are the, what have the smaller countries done? Uh, I think that's a really uh, key question. The, um, the smaller countries can't just say uh, the parents is calling and we've had enough and, 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 and we uh, I, I take that point. Um, uh, Sri Lanka is looking at FPAs, separate FPAs. So not just some regional bilateral, basically, with uh, with India to expand its FTA. The uh, president went to Bangladesh recently and uh, talked about an FTA with Bangladesh as well. So I think uh, it already has an FTA with Pakistan. So I think it's looking at that through bilateral trade agreements, basically. Where it's not doing enough is about communicating the benefits of that. And it really you know, it needs to step up and explain uh, what are the benefits of these uh, trade agreements so they don't just get uh, shut down in the local newspapers and you know, that, that's not the end of it. Okay, Germany, please. Thank you, Jeff. First, just to briefly address Monica's uh, questions that you raised. Uh, the asymmetry management example that can be taken is ASEAN and the asymmetry between uh, Indonesia and the very, very small neighbors that it has, how well it has been managed to make ASEAN functional is an example closer to home than going elsewhere to see what examples they have. Uh, in terms of the bilateral trade and cooperation between states within the region, as uh, Dinusha points out, sufficient efforts are being made but here again, also for the state of Bangladesh, we would like more cooperative approaches from India, for example. Uh, for example, Nepal and Bhutan has been trying to get the very small transit, I think a couple of miles, am I right, Tisha, of land transit that the Nepalese trucks can enter Bangladesh and come to our port. We have not got it so far. It was signed when the Prime Minister visited Delhi about six years back, even then it has not been implemented. So I think a slightly more proactive political commitment to allow the free flow among the states within the region will also enforce the cooperation at a more regional level. As a question was raised there very rightly, the point I was trying to make about Haman Tota Port is that this is the order of the day. This is just the beginning. I, I can tell you, really, this is just the beginning. All countries in the region will have been lured into such kind of deals, and nobody's going to refuse it, unless we find out ways 
how we can together benefit from it. Because we will not be denying it. No country in the region will deny such kind of offers coming from BRI directly or from China directly. Any country in the region that you see will not deny it. This is the reality of life. And the surveys are again a reality of life. Uh, that's why I said in my presentation that we have got to go past deniability. Because by denying the reality of life, we are not getting anywhere. Uh, well, Anissa's question about the SAT process, that's actually a multi-million dollar question. <laughs> and the only way to make it functional is to open up the space. We are all eager to open up the space, but the major players have to open up their arms and open up the space so that the process can be revitalized again and the process can benefit the people. I would agree with you that the major players will never allow it to be people-centric because then it will overtake all the barriers that they're building. So people process will be kept out of the SAR process. It will remain a bureaucratic process unless the political master decide otherwise. Uh, very short uh, two comments. One is that uh, Mr. Javed Bhatti has mentioned that uh, uh, South Asian should be left out of the process because we are here to just look after the uh, SARC as a regional organization, how it can be re energized, etc. The thing is that the question of sub regionalism or the question of um, some other regionalism comes in because of the extreme frustration that we all have about the process of SARC achieving almost nothing in 30 years. Uh, now, 30 years is one generation. Now, we cannot wait for another generation to see whether India and Pakistan can resolve their disputes and then the process can go on. So, we will have to look elsewhere because there is need for connectivity, there is need for regional cooperation. So, uh, whether it's the sub region can also become a small region, one. Second thing is that a different region with part of this region and part of some other region can also become uh, the, the driver that can deliver the thing. Uh, that's why it's, it's because SARC has not delivered, so we look at SARC. One. Um, a very short comment about uh, Dr. Joseph. Actually, uh, Mr. Morizawan has already uh, pointed it out. Uh, as I mentioned, that the that SARC is different from other regions. Uh, when Afghanistan was not there, Afghanistan is the latest front. Uh, if you just look at the map, no country has border with another country except with India. No other country has a common border with another country. But everyone has, of course, if we consider Sri Lanka, that it has the sea, so you can go anywhere. But otherwise, Nepal, Bhutan, Pakistan, they have only border with India and not with each other in none, none of the cases. So, um, and the size, of course, matters. <coughs> then, the, how it should have been done is that. If India had been proactive, as I mentioned, it has to take the leadership, then it would have opened up. It would have opened up for others, particularly the smaller countries, so that it can go ahead. Uh, we have, Dhaka has a, almost daily connectivity with every capital, except the capital of Pakistan. But we have connectivity with Karachi. Uh, I think that's what I wanted to ask. Thank you. Uh, General Bakunji. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think I was very impressed with the presentation from Sri Lanka and the conference that you had last and uh, the results of which you shared with us. The type of strategic thinking that Sri Lanka and your institution in particular has been doing is I think really remarkable. This precise type of strategic planning and strategic considerations that must be made in our thinking of regional cooperation. And I think in that context it is also very important to realize and understand as the nature of the Belt and Road Initiative of China. It's a wonderful project. I've been fortunate enough in the last several years to have been associated with this and that's an announcement by the talk, uh, Vice President Xi Jinping. But let's also accept that the ultimate aim of that project is to benefit the Chinese economy, not the Sri Lankan economy or anybody else's economy. Will it benefit as a consequence? That's of course a big question. Just coming back from uh, uh, Central Asia last week, I can see the enormous potential for development in all Central Asia, military investments and infrastructure construction. But if you look uh, realistically on some of the things 
for example, on the uh, 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 A complex, airport and other complex, or the port complex. You know, there are great dangers in that. Air transport technology is undergoing major change. Excellent airports in all of Southeast Asia, all the capitals, all the uh, aircraft in the world today are long haul large uh, passenger carrying aircraft. So, unfortunately, technologically and geographically, Ambandota did not compete. And that can be a potentially an enormous loss. Ambandota as a port, you know, Sri Lanka is fortunate to have some of the finest ports in South East. The Trincomalee port is by far the best, or perhaps by far the, perhaps the best port in all of Asia. And of course, Sri Lanka has been generous to offer India uh, the first choice to utilize that. To look at the commercial potential of that, that's where the problem comes. Now, actually, common Port is big enough to handle all the bulk breaking tasks for South Asia. India is unfortunate not to have deep sea ports in both its eastern and western coasts. But in today's technology, building a deep sea port from a natural like, absence of port is not very difficult. Cost some money, but it can. So I think a strategy that Sri Lanka has adopted includes South Asia as its sort of centre for uh, 300, 500 million people is a tremendous uh, uh, potential for success. And in working out these economic projects, this uh, regional consultations and considerations become very vital. I remember just five, seven years ago in Singapore on a dialogue, on a discussion on uh, China-India relations. The issue of Hamantota had port had come up. Unfortunately, it was driven by political objectives rather than economic objectives the land of Mosila Francis done. And therefore, I am concerned that such ports being built with international money or Chinese money, if they are not successful, what does the country have to pay for it? And this is also the consequences that Pakistan has to think about regarding the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Enormous potential, enormous development, but each of those projects, have to be economically sustainable, has to make money for China. Will all those projects in Pakistan make money for China and therefore make money for Pakistan as well and therefore be sustainable? So these are some of the issues that come up. Uh, Mr. Pandey. The last uh, uh, panelist, Good morning to the global argument. We are talking about and we are listening about how to do in a As a doctor, if you raise this issue, that, that, that is the trust of the matter. And what I am suggesting is that SARC was burned because of a vision that few leader who are proactive and who could do that. But that is that is. Right now there are some positive aspects uh, in South Asia which has some leaders. Yes. All leaders in South Asia right now they are on schedule. Quick and taking decisions. And even the political systems are preserved, except India, where there is a prime minister, very powerful, still, and who has a, who is thinking not for the next two years, but for the next seven years. But the problem is, there is a deficit of trust among the South. So we have to find out the answer right Now, the another part is that. Uh, First time in South Asia, all countries are democratically elected. When we say that democratically elected government, that means they are very sensitive to the public opinion. Now the answer is here. The answer is that if you can like this, you should continue to create public opinion, to push the leadership, to re-energize the leadership to remember their forefathers, who with their vision and proactive role, 
bigger loss to the sun. If we created the problem of the year, and so that the Mukherjee elected leaders will have to listen, then they will be as sensitive to the problem. So that is the answer. And uh, the three times look like this. If you continue to have this set of seminars, talks, items, articles, and creating a public opinion, pushing the governments in power, I'm sure that the result will be favorable. And the answer to Professor Mitra will also come here that the start will be re energized and a lot of credit goes to the tanker scientists. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, very apt to last words, which brings our discussion to, to, a, uh, to a close. Uh, <coughs> the general uh, sense of the house was slightly pessimistic, I thought, uh, but with reason. That's the idea. The idea is to not. The idea was not to go ahead and energize SAR. The idea was to discuss the potent potentialities and prospects, to point out the difficulties, etc. We have done that in great detail, Mr. Bertie. I hope he realizes what he's taking on now. He's taking on the other segment of the discussion. If SARC hasn't worked, is there a prospect for sub-regional organizations? And that's the point. He has got some views on it, obviously, and that's what he's going to check. Uh, but the sense also is that, is South Asia merely a geographical expression, or is there more to South Asia than, than pure geography? The state system is South Asia. Uh, and this is for, for uh, great uh, political scientists like Professor Mitra Franke to answer, is the state, state building complete in South Asia? Have we seen the end of it all? Or is it a work in progress? Uh, uh, some of you mentioned Shashi Tharoor's book. Uh, one critique of the thing is that it ignores the British position really sometimes. I mean, remember that partition was, uh, uh, was the least possible uh, the last option that uh, the British had in 1947. Earlier on, there was a cabinet mission plan. And the cabinet mission plan was something, and Anisha Spine and Gozi and I have had, have had long discussions on this, a tripartite uh, division of India into uh, Muslim-majority states, uh, Hindu-majority states, and Bengal and Assam. And Bengal and Assam. So that, that was actually Stafford Cripps considered idea as to what would be the best dominion kind of option for India. Three, almost three dominions, three groups, he said, but eventually these would have uh, evolved into three dominions. Would that have been a better option? We don't know. Uh, but uh, nothing, nothing, uh, I've been a diplomat for too long to know that any, nothing is written in stone. Yugoslavia was not written in stone. So, unless our leaderships uh, 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 take action to defend their status quo positions, which I believe in their perceived political interests, uh, we could possibly see changes in the system. We don't know whether it's been good or whether it's been bad. Uh, obviously, South Asia has many value systems. Uh, it has many cultures. It, it's an amalgam. It's a, it's a uh, tapestry of cultures, and that very late strength. And we thought we could have we would have been able to build on it. Uh, it's for history to say whether we have succeeded or not. But uh, one thing we can, uh, uh, I think there would be consensus around the house uh, that that it, it is well worthwhile making an attempt. Uh, on, on the word consensus, by the way, attempt of, of building a cooperation within what is the world's least integrated segment. Now, there is a difference between consensus and what was the other word we uh, used? Uh, 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 the thing that we, uh, uh, what was it, consensus and what was the other word? Huh? Huh? Unanimity. Un unanimity. Okay. Uh, this, this was also the problem that uh, we settled for unanimity when we should have perhaps settled for consensus because consensus is a broad sense in a Rousseau's general way. That is consensus. But we went for unanimity because of the differences that existed in the talk about. Anyway, thank you very much for these contributions. We will try to relate all these uh, arguments together into some kind of a workable thesis. Uh, uh, we uh, hope to be able to 
that by the middle of next year. Okay, we will speak on that. And uh, I will invite you to a cup of tea, uh, next 20 minutes or so, and uh, request that we gather here back again at 3.40 sharp for the segment on uh, re uh, some regional initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair and distinguished speakers. Uh, before we proceed to our tea break, I might invite the Chair to give a token of appreciation to the speakers, please. Uh, to all the speakers here? Yes. First to Sir Ramesh Nath Pandey. Major General Dipankar Banerjee. Major General Munir Munir Zaman. Ambassador Mohammed Tahid Hussain. Dr. Dinusha Panditaratne. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, speakers. We will now adjourn and you are invited to a tea reception outside. I remind you to be back to the auditorium by 3.40 please in order to resume the workshop.